grow closer as a congregation um, so that we can help each other with that. Absolutely. Stephanie's pointing out how that we need to grow closer together as the people of God to help one another go to heaven. You know, we're on a journey together. And every time we baptize someone at Dallin Road, uh, and I'm making the announcement, I'm, I'll, I'll say, uh, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Williams was just baptized. Jim, we're glad to have you here at Dallin Road. We want you to really be a part of us want you to engage in the work and the worship here. Be present at all the services. And Jim, we need your help. We need you to help us go to heaven. We're going to help you go to heaven. And we, we state that when someone has just been baptized. Okay, you guys have got the idea of a mission. And, and maybe if you put all those thoughts together and you sat down and you just had a session where you spent one hour just refining a mission statement, it would become crystal, crystallized in your thinking where everybody says, yeah, that's who we are. That's why we exist. We've got purpose now. And see, that, that gives you a reason for being together, a reason for doing what you're doing. Okay, vision. What is vision? All right, vision. Oh, wait a minute. I've got a statement up here already prepared. And look at what it includes. It is to glorify God by leading others to Christ and helping one another grow in Jesus so we can be with him in heaven. Look at all the factors that are involved there. First of all, it's to glorify God. A couple of you said that. And here's the work of evangelism, leading, leading others to Christ. And then here comes the work that we talked about uh, that Brother Mike mentioned, helping one another grow in Jesus for the edifying of the body of Christ, the work of ministry. And here's that end of life objective so we can be with him in heaven. Now, see, look at that. And, and look, this is a mission statement that we came up with at Dallin Road. Our elders and deacons worked together for uh, a couple of sessions, and this is what we came up with, uh, and this is what we're trying to do. We see this as our mission. This is why we exist, and it contains these four elements. And there's more about that in the previous lesson, to, previous to where you are on your worksheet right now. But what about vision? What is vision? When we think about that, what is vision? And again, you can look at your worksheet right in the middle of that page. And vision, there's a lot of ways to express it. The way I've expressed it here is what we want to build. This is where we intend to be in X number of years. And let me, and this is risky. This is risky. Where do you think the church, your congregation, should be in five years? What is your vision for the Cortland Avenue Church or for the Woodland Hills Church? I want you to think in terms, what is our vision? Come up with something. And, and someone says, well, I wouldn't want to be too unrealistic. I, I wouldn't want to, uh, I'm going to be careful. I don't want to say too much because maybe if we can just maintain the status quo for the next five years, we'll be okay. You can do better than maintain status quo. I want you to think, where do you hope to be in five years? Just ponder that. What do you hope to be doing? What's your vision for the future? I commented to you a while ago that some churches do not plan beyond next Sunday service. Maybe they've got a gospel meeting planned a year or two from now, but beyond that, there's nothing really planned for the future. And let me tell you something, folks. People who don't plan for the future are planning to fail because you will fail if you don't make plans for the future. It's just like if you're running a business. If you're running a business, you've got to always be thinking about next year and five years and even ten years out. And you have to plan for those things. Otherwise, you are going to be the victim of circumstances. And churches become the victim of circumstances. Cultural change takes place. You're not prepared to meet the cultural change, and so you decline. So I want you to think about vision. I'll give you about a half a minute to write something down. Where do you think the church should be in five years? All right, I know that's not much time, but tell me some of the things that you wrote down. Randy, I'm going to start with you again. I'd like to see our attendance beyond Sunday night, what our Sunday morning attendance is now. 
What is the Sunday morning attendance now? And what's Sunday night run right now? 60%? That's, that's about average today. And you'd like to see the Sunday night attendance to be up around 80 or 90. Okay. And Sunday morning be that much higher. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that's, that's, that may be realistic. Someone else on this side, give me something that you wrote down for your congregation. Something that you think, okay, five years from now I'd like to see what? Vision. Give me some help, guys. How about elders for the church? And is that necessarily going to take five years? How many elders do you want, Yvonne? I want 20 elders. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me, t let me tell you a story about one of the churches in northern Africa in, I think this is the late second century. You know, we worry congregations, oh, it's getting too big, we can't know everybody, okay? I don't know where that's at in the Bible, where you can't have a congregation where you don't know everybody. But one of the churches in northern Africa, and I forget the source on this, it came from what's called the Antonicene Fathers. These were the church writers after the first century and before 325 A.D. when they had the Nicene Creed. One of the churches in northern Africa had 254 elders in the church. What was the size of the congregation? I don't know, but it must have been pretty good size, wouldn't you guess? 254 elders and only seven deacons. Because that church took the view that Acts chapter 6, you appoint seven men who will be over this business, that seven was a binding example, and so they couldn't have more than seven deacons. Uh, that was not a binding example. That was how many were needed for the job in that case. But uh, you, get, you get the point that... Uh, yeah, I'd like to have 20. How about three? How about five? You know, it may be possible if you think in terms of that. And the latter half of your book, much of that is about elders and about uh, the kind of character elders need to have and the kind of work that elders need to do. Great vision for the future. Five years from now, let's have elders. We can do that. That's, that's within the realm of possibility. Okay, over on this side, give me some f feedback. Diana. New families, more kids, larger Bible classes. The pr that's all good. But the problem is, what the, what's the problem there with what you just gave? You gave three things and they're all good, but there's a problem with them. It's very vague. It's very vague. That's right. Vision needs to be specific. If you're running... <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've got more to come, don't we? And a, a vision, though, needs to be... You've got to put some numbers to it. If you don't have markers to measure it, it's like your, your husband was saying a little while ago. If you don't have some metric for measuring it, how do you know when you've reached success? Well, you know, we say, well, we just want to do better in the future. Okay, who doesn't? We all want to do better, but what are the markers that we can say, 12 months from now, here's where we hope to be. And then 24 months, then five years, then 10 years. We have to have those markers. Uh, and so what you've got are good, but there need to be some numbers where you can have something to shoot for. Now, sometimes we don't reach numbers. But if we don't set numbers, chances are we won't do anything at all. It's like uh, Alice in Wonderland. Alice is lost. She comes across the Chesser cat. And she says, would you tell me which way to go from here? And the cat says, well, where do you want to go? And Alice says, it doesn't much matter to me. It's got to matter where you go. The future's got to matter. And you've got to have something that says, you know, is it possible for us in the next five years to add two new families a year? Now someone says, well, you can't, you can't say you're going to get two new families a year. Well, if you don't do something, chances are you won't get any families. And, and yeah, the question is, why not? Uh, there are things we can do, but here's the problem. Someone says, well, you're just going to go out and try to find two new families to come. Well, actually, we're going to try to find way more than two. But we're going to say, at least we've got a goal. We've got something we're going to shoot for. 
And it may or may not be realistic, but we're setting something out there as a vision for the future. And without vision, you won't get the job done. You know, you, you may have a, uh, let's say you and your husband open a little business here in Kokomo. It's a printing company. And you have some success. And in the first three years, uh, you go from just the two of you to having three full-time employees. And you're thinking, you know, maybe we should expand our business over to Marion and over to Lafayette and up to Peru. You have to have something that you're shooting for. And after a while, if, if you say, well, you know, let's not risk anything. Let's just kind of stay where we are. Then you really don't go anywhere. So you've got to have something to shoot for. That's vision, thinking about the future. Give me something else for vision on this side, guys. Yes, sir. Two fifty four. You know, you're getting into something that's in that leadership material later on where we talk about that ratio. An ideal ratio of elders to members is about 25 to 1 or 30 to 1. At, at our congregation at home, all of our shepherds, we have 11, all of us have a list of sheep. Uh, there's a list that I deal with. That, that's where my focus is. Uh, Brother Don has a list of his own. Brother David has a list of his own. Brother Buckley has a list of his own. We, and we come together once a month, and we have what we call sheep meetings, where we gather for nothing but to discuss the condition of our sheep. We have another meeting every month that we call a shepherding meeting, where we gather to talk about upping our game as shepherds, how we're going to do a better job of shepherding the sheep. But in that, we've learned that an ideal ratio is about 25 to 1, 30 to 1. Currently, we are about 38 to 1, and that's too high. We need two or three or four or five more shepherds, or like Yvonne said, we'd like to have 20. If we had 20 shepherds, we'd, we'd be in the roughly the 20 to 1 range, something like that. That's an ideal range. Uh, there's more on that. You can read that for yourself. Anyone else on this side that would like to make a comment? Vision. You see, what vision does, it, it's what you want to build. And here's what we're looking for, a numerically growing and grounded congregation. But it's, that's, again, that's very vague, isn't it? And so we have to be specific as to our vision. And I think if you'll turn over to the next page, page 24, 24, and listen, this, this is something you can work on more on your own at some other time. But look there under vision. See uh, the important principle, the top of the page, mission, then you see vision. Here's where we intend to be in X number of years. Now, we've written this general statement for our congregation at home. But here are some specifics. Let's say you put yourself out 10 years. In 10 years, we hope to have a congregation of how many people with a 90% return rate. That gets back to what Randy was talking about. You have to have something, you know, uh, again, some markers, and you're looking to have a higher number of people who come back. We're trying at home to get a 90% return rate. That's, that's pretty tough to do. Currently, our attendance last Sunday was 360 in the morning and 270-something in the evening. That's a 75% return rate. That's about where we are, 70 to 75% return rate. But we're, I've got some thoughts for moving forward. Strategy that I hope will raise that, maybe we can get up to 80%. If we get to 80, maybe we can get up to 85%. But you have to have some numbers that you're going to work with. This vision is a general statement, numerically grounded, numerically growing and grounded congregation. It's like uh, one of your brothers was saying a moment ago, that you want the numerical growth, but you want the spiritual growth also. Okay, that brings us to our third thing, and our third thing is strategy. <laughs> and that's how we plan to get there. This is what we're actually going to do. You see, you can talk mission to death. You can talk vision to death. 
and never come up with a strategy. Strategy is where you're going to specify here are the things that we are going to do. And so I want you to turn back to page 22 again. And look at that third thing right in the middle of the page, strategy. This is how you're going to accomplish it. And so some of you have already come up with a general mission, and you've come up with some thoughts on vision. Now I want you to write down, say, three things. What are three strategies you can use that will help you accomplish your mission? And I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do that. Write down three things that will help you accomplish your mission. Strategies. And I'm sorry for the people who are watching the stream online. You're just going to have to hang with us. Maybe you're penciling this. Maybe you're writing down your strategy also. I hope you are. Strategy is how. How we plan to get there. How we're going to accomplish what we do. What are some things we can do, strategy, that will help us to accomplish our mission and to reach our vision? I'll give you another 60 seconds. Another 20 seconds and we're done. All right, I want you to tell me what you came up with. Randy, do I start with you again? Give me something about strategy. Okay, so you're going to work to, you've got some, there has to be strategy. And what you're doing is identifying the problem, but what is your strategy for doing that? What's your strategy for fixing it? Well, I can say one example would be for the people that don't feel comfortable with weather like that. Make sure they understand how to use the technology. Okay. Okay. All right. Is there another way? Is there a way to get them here on Sunday night in, when the weather is bad? That's what you want. You'd, you don't want people to get used to staying home watching the service on Sunday night. There is, but they don't, if they don't want to get out on a slick sidewalk, I understand. Okay, okay. Maybe, you know, maybe the strategy is for the elderly who have trouble getting out. Maybe the strategy is for the able body to get over there and clean their sidewalk really good. Salt the drive. And then you go pick them up on Sunday afternoon to bring them to services. There, there are ways, the point is there are ways to do that. Now that, that helps to achieve your goal of upping your Sunday night attendance. Okay, someone else give me a strategy. Virginia, you've got something. Okay. Invite five people to come. And I use the cards, and I don't know where the last of my cards went. I've, I have gave some of them out. Yeah, here's the cards that we were talking about if you didn't see one last night. Look, look over across the page on page 23. Uh, there toward the, just below the middle of the page, let's explore what we currently do and why we do these things. And what I've done here is I've written down what we do at home as a congregation. Okay, the first ones are givens in order to worship God, encourage one another. We organize two services on the Lord's Day. But look down at number four. In order to equip saints to teach, preach, serve needy saints, do evangelism and lead worship, we provide special classes, studies, and opportunities that will train people in these areas. And our primary point in training in evangelism is train people to use these cards. Someone says, well, that's too easy. Listen, for some people it's hard 
to go up to someone that you don't know and just speak to them and say, uh, I'd like to invite you to come to the Dowlin Road Church. Now, I give you this card, but it's my last one. Oh, you can have it. Okay. <laughs> Listen, we just, this is part of what we are at home. And, and churches that are being successful, you think, well, that's, that's just too simple. That's not going to do enough for you. Yeah, it is. Let me, let me read to you what's on the back of the card. If you're ever looking for a church, see, this is low pressure. If you're looking for a church where your kids can really learn the Bible, and listen, a lot of people in our culture, they're worried about their kids not learning. And they see dangers in the culture. They know the Bible has some answers. If you're looking for a church that teaches the truth from God's Word, if you're looking for a church where joy and forgiveness are real, that's what we're about here, joy and forgiveness. You're looking for a church with solid Bible answers for troubled times. You're looking for a church that's a real family of caring Christians. I recommend the Dowlin Road Church of Christ. I recommend the Cortland Avenue Church of Christ. And listen, there's a brother down in Kentucky who makes these cards for us. He just printed up 5,000 of these for us just uh, two or three months ago. And I don't think it cost us much over 100 bucks to get 5,000 of these. This is cheap, easy evangelism. And it's something we do, and it gets people to come. We make contacts. Contacts lead to visitors. Those are potential converts. We set up studies with some of them, and we convert some of them. And it's just like that. This is where we're getting our people. Yes, sir? So we said our vision is to numerically grow the block and then have a brown red town congregation, right? So um, we could look at the potential of moving the physical location of the building. Oh, wait a minute. We well, well, no, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Move the physical location of the building? Well, not the building, but we're, we're sell this building and, and find a new location. Sell this building and find a new location? Yes. I will tell you, brother. That's going to require faith and courage, which is what we need in God's kingdom today. And sometimes the physical location will hurt your growth. When, when I told you we had the trailer park with all the snakes next to us at uh, the Pinecrest building. Across the street was Sanford and Son. We temporarily moved to another location for two and a half years. And the temporary location where we were was just as bad as where we came from. But it was temporary to get us to where we are today. And we were right next to the high school. Central High School was their parking lot was up against our parking lot. And kids from Central High School would gather behind our building before services, before classes rather, in the morning and smoke dope. And there we are in this drafty old building. Tony Mock and I were preaching there at the time. And marijuana smoke comes dra <laughs> wafting into our offices. We could smell it. And then, sometimes when it came time for lunch for the kids, there would be kids that would leave the high school and come, boys and girls who would leave, and do things behind our bushes that shouldn't be done. That's the kind of neighborhood we were in. We had to get out of that neighborhood. At night, people were breaking into our cars. We had to have one of our deacons out there and a policeman out there watching our parking lot. There comes a time when you have to move to another place. And that's something you have to judge whether or not you've got the courage and the faith to do that. But that's part of vision. You have to be thinking ahead. I, I, I will give you my opinion on what we should have done 43 years ago. We had... We had attendance of about 180 in this building that would seat about 130 at the time. And we said, what do we do? Do we start a new congregation? Some people said, yeah, let's start another congregation in another part of town. That was a bad idea. We didn't go that route. The other idea was we sell the present facility we had and start anew in a different neighborhood, build a bigger facility. Then the third idea was expand where we are, and that's what we wound up doing. My judgment is we should have gone to another location 43 years ago. That's my, that's my judgment on that, and I, w I wish we had done that. We didn't. And after a while, you know, we, we grew to where we filled this building here. Well in excess of 200 people on Sunday morning, 180 on Sunday night. That was 1977 and 78. Uh, there comes a time when you say, we need a different facility. And that's a hard decision to make. The church at, uh, 
uh, what was what was the congregation used to be called where you before Woodland Hills was built? West Side. Yeah, West Side Church, and they it came time to build a new building, and they went out and built the Woodland Hills building. There came a time for that, and that's a that's a powerful decision that a congregation has to deal with, but it's part of vision for the future. And if you say, well, we're just going to stay in this location no matter what, what happens, what comes. Okay. And you have to deal with that as it is. And you don't expect, you know, when we built our new facility in 1990, I told the brethren, if we build it, they will come. And we had contacts immediately. We baptized people immediately. There's so much could be said about that. But your, your point is a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This works. If you don't do anything else, you can do this. But I recommend you do a whole lot more than this. Okay. Any any final thoughts on uh, strategy? What are some other strategies? Anyone? Yes, Paul. Yeah, how about prayer meetings where you pray for the lost? How about prayer meetings where you say, let's pray for the courage to take a card out of her pocket and give it to someone? I have given out, I could not tell you how many cards over the last several years. We've been doing this for years. It's where our growth has come from. Only one time have I had anyone not accept the card. Uh, people don't bite. You give the card to someone and say, hey, my name is Max. I'd love to invite you to come to Dowlin Road Church. You can do that. Now, don't say your name is Max, okay? <laughs> I was in a Kroger store, and there's the, the Coke guy stocking the, the Cokes, his big section he's got. And I gave him a card. I said, hey, my name is Max. I'd love to have you come visit us at Dallin Road. He looked at the card and said, you better give that to someone else. This is not something I'm interested in. I said, well, maybe someday you'll change your mind. No, take the card back. One time out of many hundreds one time. On one occasion, Brother Benjamin Lee and I, Benjamin Lee just moved away from us and is now working in Louisville, Texas. Benjamin Lee and I were on an elevator with 10 other people. And I, say, uh, I said, uh, hey, we're glad you all came today. <laughs> We'd like to invite you to Dowling Road Church. And we each passed out five cards to the other people. Where were they going to go? They were trapped in the elevator for how many seconds going to the next floor. And so we invited 10 people. You can do this, this, and it kind of becomes a fun thing after a while. Most of the time when you give them to someone, they'll look at the card and they say, why, thank you. I might just come sometime. And they might. And when they show up, ooh, that's our Sunday afternoon lesson at 2 o'clock, what we do when they show up. Yes, sir? The other aspect is taking those cards and actually going next door to the neighbor you hadn't talked to ever and you'd lived here 10 years and hand them a card and build a relationship with them and the person next door on the other side and build a relationship with them. And you, those cards can be used for people you see every day, all the time, and that you live around that you're afraid to actually walk next door and say hi to. Yeah, it's an easy thing to do. Is it Phil? Phil, Phil the problem with that, and I recommend doing it, the problem with it is you've, let, you've lived next door to me all these years and you've never invited me once. Shame on Shame on me. And so you say, you say to your neighbor, you know, for years you and I have lived next door to each other. I know you. I know your kids. I have never invited you to church. I and I apologize for that. Here, let me do it now. And so you can, you can use that as a way of kind of clearing your own conscience on it and still inviting them. I moved into the place where I had a, a year ago. I know 20 of my neighbors already. There you go. If you're at a restaurant and you wrap that with your tip, why they'll take it. Yeah, take it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you, you wrap a $5 bill around this and they, they will pick it up. Uh, don't stiff your waitress, okay? <laughs> don't be chintzy. If you you be, need to be generous when you give these out at a, at a restaurant. There's so many ways to use these cards 
And it works, folks. That's all I'm saying. It works, okay? Any final thoughts? There's a whole lot more about mission, vision, and strategy. Let me, let me just kind of summarize with this, that everything flows downward from our mission. Here's why we exist. God's given us a mission, and we, we're thinking about that mission that God has given us to the whole world. Here now is what we envision. If we work the mission, here's how it's going to uh, work out in our lives and the life of the congregation. And then how do we plan to get there? And you know what? You might start off with just something as simple as let's really make this a part of who and what we are. Evangelism is part of our DNA here. DNA, uh, what does that stand for? Paul, I bet you can tell me how to pronounce the word. Uh, yeah, some kind of acid, okay. Nucleic acid, dioxy, something, something, nucleic acid. But let evangelism be a part of your DNA. Work outward instead of just thinking inward. And it will do, it will do some good for us. Uh, anyone have a final comment? We're going to wrap this session up. We've got two more sessions we're going to try to do in the after. Yes, sir. Friendly, friendly, caring, outgoing to all. See, you're, t you're going back now to my first lesson this morning about loving people in the church and loving people outside the church. Absolutely. Friendly, caring, that's tomorrow afternoon's lesson at 2 o'clock. I, I know you guys from Marion probably can't come back at 2, but we're going to talk about some things that we can do in our congregation to really pull this off. And if, if there's nothing final... Can we close this session with a prayer? Let's bow. Our Father and our God in heaven, we humble ourselves before you, thanking you, Lord, for this time that we've had to come together on this Saturday morning to think about the work of your kingdom. God, you've given us a great work, and we're humbled by that. We recognize, Father, our own inadequacies in accomplishing anything in respect to the labors that are set before us. And yet we know, God, with your help, your providence, and your sovereignty opening doors for us, you can make things happen that we could never accomplish on our own. And so, Father, our trust is in you. Help us, Father, that we might employ those things that we have at our, as resources to use those things in the growth of your kingdom. Give us success, Father, not for our own glory, not for our boasting, but our boast is in our Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory, for the glory of your kingdom and for the glory of eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brethren. We're going to start up again at 1.30. Is that it, Jeff?